Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Press, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Yesterday, uh, at the end of the program, we were talking about the events that were that occurred subsequent, immediately subsequent to the suppression and abolition of the Jesuits by Pope Clement XIV in 1773. And beginning on the first full paragraph on page 238 of the book, The Footprints of the Jesuits, the author says, To give effect to the decree of abolition, the general of the Jesuits was was arrested and held in confinement. The members were dispersed among different ecclesiastical establishments in Rome. Their buildings were taken possession of. Seals were placed upon their papers and their schools were turned over to the management of others. Notice particularly how the Vatican dealt with the Jesuits. First, the Jesuit general was arrested and held in confinement. The members of the Jesuit order were dispersed among different ecclesiastical establishments in Rome. In other words, they were disbanded and given occupation elsewhere. And it says... Listen to this. Their buildings were taken possession of. The equivalent of that in the United States would be all their novitiates, all their uh, uh, provincial uh, offices, and their universities and schools, and all the headquarters of the Jesuits in this country. It says their buildings were taken possession of, Boy, would I love to see the equivalent of that in the United States. It would take an armed force to do it. But to literally surround every Jesuit institution with heavy armory, throw a, throw a, a quarantine over the building, don't let anybody in or out, go in and take possession of the premises, and, and seal up all of their documents, all of their intelligence and place a seal under it until it was safe enough to investigate every every occupation of the Jesuits in this country. It says seals were placed upon their papers and their schools were turned over to the management of others. Boy, would I like that responsibility, right? It says, proceedings were instituted against General Ritchie and other members of the society, and he and the secretary, together with several of the prominent fathers, were sent to the castle of St. Angelo and held as state prisoners. The Jesuit general and the provincials of this country would be taken to a federal institution and held as state prisoners. Would to God that that would become a reality in this country. That's how the Vatican dealt with the Jesuits after the suppression. The United States could follow the lead of the Vatican in how to deal with the Jesuits. If this country would ever awaken to the real horror that the Jesuits are in this country. He says the crimes charged against them and of which they were convicted, were, quote, that they had attempted both by insinuations and by more open efforts to stir up a revolt in their own favor, to stir up a revolt in their own favor against the apostolic see, in other words, against the papacy, that they had published and circulated throughout all Europe libels against the Pope, in one of which Pope Clement the Fourteenth was charged of having been elected by simony, and that three of the most prominent Jesuits, Lefebvre, Forestier, and, Gert- and Gautier, were loudly repeating everywhere that the Pope was the Antichrist. Unquote. <laughs> Again, the pot, the pot called the kettle black. Now, the society generally, but not unanimously, exhibited this same spirit of resistance to the Pope and the authority of the Church. 
By the, de- by the decree of abolition, the members were allowed to act as secular priests and exercise sacerdotal functions subject to the authority of the church. In other words, not subject to the authority of the general who was in prison, incommunicado. Now, it says a few of them availed themselves of this provision and, quote, settled themselves quietly in different capacities, unquote. In other words, they were just biding their time. And it says, others endeavored insidiously to preserve the principle of their constitution and organization by abandoning the name of Jesuits and adopting other titles. And we touched on that yesterday. They simply abandoned the name Jesuits and became the Illuminati. Okay? And they eventually, you know, influenced Freemasonry. They found refuge within Freemasonry, and we'll talk about that in a greater detail someday here on the broadcast. Now, quote, but, says Nicolini, the greater part, the most daring and restless, would not submit to the brief of suppression, impugned its validity in a thousand writings, called in question the validity of Pope Clement's election, whom they called parricide, sacrilegious, simoniac, and considered themselves still forming part of the still existing company of Jesus. In other words, they outwardly rebelled. They condemned the Pope as as having Ill, unlawfully usurped the authority of the church, and that they they continued to ignore his bull of suppression. Now, he continues, and this is where we left off yesterday. Catherine, Empress of Russia, had given some protection to the Jesuits before their suppression, and Ritchie, the general, uh, by the way, his full name was Lorenzo, Lorenzo Ritchie, the general, admitted in his examination that he had held correspondence with Frederick of Prussia after the decree. After the decree. And it says, how is it to be accounted for in any mode consistent with due respect for the church that the Jesuits in Russia did not withdraw themselves from the protection of the emperor and that others sought shelter and protection in Prussia after the decree of the Pope had declared the order to be forever abolished throughout the world. So, after their abolition, the Jesuits found refuge and protection in Russia and Prussia. Okay? Now, keep in mind, Russia is not a Roman Catholic country. The Pope has no jurisdiction in Russia. Russia was a refuge for the Eastern Orthodox Church the product of the first great schism of the Roman Catholic Church, who who were persecuted by the Roman Church in the in the in the East and found refuge in Russia and it it, the, uh, the Greek Orthodox Church essentially became the state religion of Russia under the protection of the government. But the Jesuits found refuge in a non-Roman Catholic country. They were reviled throughout all of Europe, all of quote-unquote Christian Europe, whether they be Roman Catholics, uh, which I say is not Christianity at all, and Protestants, they were reviled in Europe, even by the Roman Catholic monarchies of Europe. They were sick and tired of Jesuit uh, uh, intrigue and the fomentation of controversy and war and assassinations and governmental meddlings, and they wanted them gone. And so the Jesuits, after their abolition, found refuge in a a non... outside of the Pope's jurisdiction is what I'm trying to tell you. In other words, they allied themselves with what Rome considered to be heretics. As a matter of fact, Prussia was regarded as a Protestant nation. 
So here the Jesuits found refuge in Eastern Orthodox Russia and Protestant Prussia. They tried to move their operations outside of the temporal and spiritual influence of the Pope. In other words, they allied themselves with what the Pope regarded as heretics. Now, this demonstrates that the, that the Jesuits are, as I have asserted before, opportunistic. They're more interested in preserving themselves rather than preserving the Roman Catholic Church. Remember, Ignatius Loyola did, want, did not subject his order to the authority of the Pope. Only he had direct uh, contact with the Pope. Apparently have some congestion on the line this morning. I finally uh, reestablished communication. And I'll attempt to continue where we left off before the interruption. I was relating to the listeners that the Jesuits, after their suppression, found refuge in heretical nations outside the jurisdiction of the Pope, Russia and Prussia. Russia was under the control of the Eastern Orthodox Church, which had rebelled against the papacy, and it was also, they felt, they found refuge in Prussia, a largely Protestant nation. And so, here we have direct and abject rebellion against the papacy. And this is exactly what is asserted by this, this author, R.W. Thompson, that the Jesuits, if given an opportunity, would overthrow the papacy. Their own agenda is more important than preserving the agenda of the papacy and of the Roman Catholic Church. But what they all have in common is a desire for a global monarchism, a global government. <clears throat> and in this case, uh, there was direct antagonism between the Jesuits and the papacy, which led to their suppression by Pope Clement XIV. And now we're going to see how the Jesuits manipulated and abused their privilege, their uh, privilege in Russia and Prussia. The Jesuits never change, and having been reviled in all of Europe, they will now find the same type of resistance in Russia and Prussia, only using them for a time for their own benefit. And uh, I see we've come up on the break. You're just getting started again, and we've got to cut away for a break. But things aren't working out too well this morning. I hope my, uh, the, the patience of my listeners will persevere and will return with the reading and discussion of the book, The Footprints of the Jesuits, by R.W. Thompson, when we return from the break. You're listening to Inquisition Update on FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. One hundred days, one hundred subscribers, and at seven dollars will bring FirstAmendmentRadio.com to the minimum level necessary to sustain it through 2015. Go to support.firstamendmentradio.com. Seven dollars a month. Really, you can afford that for our Protestant First Amendment rights and the gospel of the kingdom message. Where your heart is, there will your treasure be also. Go to support. Support.firstamendmentradio.com I know you all want answers, and believe me, so do I, and I'll do my best to get them. Have you seen the Left Behind movies? Have you read the Left Behind fictional book series? Not everyone believes Left Behind is true prophecy. Some may even regard as conspiratorial the mainstream re-release of the Left Behind movie with actor Nicolas Cage portraying the main character as an attempt to further reinforce in the minds of all this perception of false prophecy in order to condition the masses for the play about to begin because they see the world stage shaping to fulfill what they have been led to believe is sound biblical interpretation a left behind rapture scenario this false view of prophecy is reinforced in the mind. 
not only of its adherents, but also includes those who have been merely exposed to the specific media, is it possible that false prophecy can be fulfilled? The rapture theories have always been in dispute. Pre-trib, mid-trib, and post-trib disputes have risen up in exclusively evangelical circles of recent history, so that when true believers don't suddenly disappear, this element will easily go by the wayside when all see a new Jewish temple begin to be built. Will this be part of the great delusion that will come upon the whole earth? It seems that this great prophetic delusion has already overcome practically the entire American evangelical and Christian world. Get the book, The Rapture Will Be Cancelled. To learn more, visit CrossTheBorder.org. That's C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org. Record budget deficits, bankruptcies galore, and the U.S. dollar is at an all-time low. With today's gloomy economic outlook, safe investments are often hard to find. For over a decade, Melody Cedarstrom at Discount Gold and Silver Trading Company has been helping people secure their future by investing in the precious metals. Melody has the honesty, integrity, and experience that is often lacking in the precious metals business. Let her put it to work for you. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 800-375-4188. That's 800-375-4188. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Welcome back from the break. You're listening to the second half hour of Inquisition Update on FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Remember that if you appreciate Inquisition Update and you would like to see it remain on First Amendment Radio, please support First Amendment Radio, who sponsors the program. Inquisition Update is brought to you by Nicholas, so help support Nicholas. Now, back to where we were before we were before the break. We're talking about where the, the Jesuits rebelliously found refuge in opposition to the church after their suppression. In Russia, which was, uh, which was in rebellion against the papacy, didn't acknowledge the jurisdiction of the papacy. They were under the, the control and influence of the Eastern Orthodox Church. They're called the Russian Orthodox Church. And Prussia was largely Protestant. So, so, so here we have the Jesuits finding refuge in what the Vatican views as heretical nations outside the jurisdiction of the papacy. 
Now, Catherine, Empress of Russia, had given some protection to the Jesuits before their suppression, and Ritchie, Lorenzo Ritchie, the Jesuit general, admitted in his examination, remember he was being questioned at the castle at St. Angelo, that he had held correspondence with Frederick of Prussia after the decree. How is it to be accounted for in any mode consistent with due respect for the Roman Catholic Church that the Jesuits in Russia did not withdraw themselves from the protection of the emperor and that <clears throat> that others sought shelter and protection in Prussia after the decree of the Pope had declared the order to be forever abolished throughout the world. Russia had long before rejected all the overtures of the Roman Catholic Church and established the Greek faith as their religion of the state, with the reigning sovereign of, of Russia as the spiritual head of that national church. The Church of Rome taught that the Russians were schismatics and, her and therefore heretics. That's how, Ru that's how Rome views the Eastern Orthodox Church and the Russian Orthodox Church. Schismatics and heretics. And, and the Jesuits find refuge there against the, the bull issued a, a, by Pope Clement XIV in 1773 for their suppression and abolition. This is nothing short of total rebellion against the papacy. Look, if, if the Jesuits would have been had their loyalties to the Roman Catholic Church, they would have accepted the authority of the Pope, they would have accepted their abolition, and they would have sought refuge within the Church. And they would have taken up the occupations that the, that the, that the Pope offered to them, that they might become secular priests, and continue to serve the church, but in other capacities. Instead, a good, me a good many of them fled the jurisdiction of the Pope and the church, and sought refuge in, in, heretic, <clears throat> in heretic Russia and Prussia. Now listen to what he says about the Prussians. He says the Prussians were Lutherans, that is, Protestants and were consequently looked upon at Rome as the deadly enemies of the church, and were, besides, under the ban of excommunication for heresy. And the Jesuits found refuge in a Protestant nation. <laughs> now stop and think. Stop and think. We have all this history. We have all of this history available to us from R.W. Thompson, and innumerable sources, authors, and books that we've read here on Inquisition Update. But we have the United States of America, a Protestant nation, regarded by the papacy, just as was Prussia, a heretic nation under the ban of excommunication. But the Jesuits are free to operate here, free to walk the halls of government, and to control here, just like they did every other nation in, in Europe. You, at some point you begin to wonder, how is this possible? And it's even hard for me to understand why Prussia allowed the Jesuits to find refuge being a Protestant nation. He says, consequently, an alliance of the Jesuits with either Russia or Prussia after their suppression could be looked upon in no other light than as an act of rebellion against the authority of the Roman Catholic Church and the papacy, a desire to pass from the jurisdiction of the Church of Rome to that of alien authority arrayed against it. So you can see how the papacy and the Roman Catholic Church must have viewed the Jesuits finding refuge in an Eastern Orthodox Russia and a Protestant Prussia, making alliances with nations that are intrinsically opposed to the papacy, abject adversaries of the papacy and of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, it amounted to a desire to exchange their allegiance for what they had considered legitimate authority 
to that of schismatics and heretics. It is impossible for the Jesuits to escape this view of the attitude they occupied after their abolition. They were simply rebels against their own church. The Jesuits in Cilicia and Prussia refused positively to obey the decree of Pope Clement XIV, paying no more regard to it than if if it had been issued by the chief of an Arab tribe. They continued to hold on to their convents and houses in the same manner as before their suppression, in doing which they directly defied the papacy. They relied upon the Lutheran Frederick for protection, preferring that to the obedience of the Pope. Frederick willingly gave them this protection because he was induced to believe that he could employ the Jesuits for the twofold purpose of strengthening monarchism, to which they were pledged by their constitution, and of supplanting the Roman by the Protestant form of Christianity. In other words, Frederick was a Protestant, but he was also a divine right monarchist, which the papacy claims can only be derived from the papacy itself. Okay, so we're mixing the holy with the profane again in Prussia, right? Now, the Jesuits flocked therefore to Cilicia from all quarters, seeking this Protestant protection, which caused Voltaire to remark in his caustic style that, quote, it would divert him beyond measure to think of Frederick as the general of the Jesuits and that he hoped this would inspire the Pope with the idea of becoming Mufti. <laughs> a Mufti to the Pope. A Mufti to Frederick. Okay, quite an insult leveled by uh, Voltaire in this quotation. Now, the kings of France and Spain called the attention of Pope Pius VI after the death of Clement XIV, to this disobedience of the Jesuits, and urged upon him the necessity of requiring that the decree of Pope Clement XIV should be strictly enforced against the Jesuits. But the attitude occupied by Pope Pius VI required him to observe extreme caution in administering the affairs of the, ch- of the Church, as he had not been directly allied with either of the factions among the cardinals at the time of his election, he felt constrained to adopt a conservative and moderate course, whereby he might, if possible, restore harmony in the church. So Pope Clement the, or Pope <laughs> Pius the Sixth, the successor of Pope Clement the Fourteenth, simply wants <laughs> to avoid the issue under the pretense of, of, of establishing some peace in the church. Now it says, He therefore refrained from identifying himself with the sovereigns who were hostile to the Jesuits, and yet did not openly espouse the Jesuit cause. Whatsoever his personal inclinations may have been, he could not, as Pope, venture to impugn the motives of his predecessor, or assail the fairness and integrity of the decree abolishing the Jesuits. He could not fail to realize that Pope Clement XIV, a canonically elected Pope, with all the powers of that office in his hands, had taken the precaution to declare that he intended the suppression to be absolute, final, and forever. He knew also that, as the Jesuits had derived the authority to exist as a religious order from the approval of one pope, it was clearly competent for another pope to withdraw that approbation and to dissolve the order, whensoever it became obvious to him that the good of the church required it. Under these circumstances, even if he had desired to do so, he manifestly was not inclined to strike what might prove to be a fatal and deadly blow at the dignity of the papal office and the authority of the church, which he undoubtedly desired to maintain in all its completeness. Consequently, he not only continued to preserve to the church the confiscated property of the Jesuits, but left the decree suppressing the order in full force, in all its entirety, during his pontificate, which terminated during the last year of the 18th century, 1799. 
The Jesuit writers have taxed their ingenuity to the utmost to explain the attitude of Pope Pius VI toward their society. They have struggled hard to prove that, notwithstanding he caused the decree of Pope Clement XIV to be executed, he was, in fact, opposed to it. One of them, heretofore cited, whose work abounds in a mixture of apologies for the conduct and the vilification of their adversary, says, quote, In the opinion of Pope Pius VI, the Society of Jesus was disbanded for a time. It was not abolished, unquote. To this it may be answered, in the first place, there's nothing to show that Pope Pius VI ever so committed himself in the second place, that Pope Clement XIV decreed that it should be abolished forever. And in the third place, if he had considered the society as suspended merely for a time, he would have revived it by his own decree, or fixed the tenure of the suspension. But this method of treating the question is trifling with a serious matter which should be treated with fairness and candor. It is equivalent to saying that Pope Pius VI executed the decree of his predecessor, which absolutely abolished the society forever, when in his conscience he did not approve it. If he did entertain this opinion, it is not shown to have been authoritatively announced to him, and to allege that he did, in the absence of proof to that effect, has the appearance of attempting to substitute fiction for fact, to make, to make history rather than to record it. The Jesuits, however, draw inferences of the favorable estimate of their society by Pope Pius VI for his kind treatment to General Ritchie while confined to the castle of St. Angelo and his release from confinement of the other Jesuits who had been arrested with him. This is far-fetched inasmuch as it may well be attributed alone to motives of benevolence. But in no event, these such, uh, but no event, but in no event are, are, are these such acts as could be, as could limit in the least degree the effect of the decree of uh, abolition so long as it continued in force, as it did during the pontificate of Pope Pius VI. Besides, the propriety of punishing individuals must have depended upon their personal agency in the offenses charged against the society as an organized body. The Jesuits derived more support for their claim that Pope Pius VI favored them by quoting language alleged to have been uttered by him, which, if actually spoken, would place him in the attitude of being upon their side and condemning the decree of his predecessor, but without the courage to relieve them from the condemnation of their conduct or from the act of suppression. This is not very complimentary to Pope Pius VI, for it represents him, uh, it represents him as saying, quote, I approve of the Society of Jesus residing in white Russia, unquote, at, a, at the same time that he continued his assent to their abolition, in all the Roman Catholic states. Okay? This is what what they're suggesting is that Pope Pius VI's attitude was literally that they upheld the abolition of the Jesuit order in Roman Catholic Europe, but not in white Russia. That That he approved of their seeking refuge in Russia, a heretic nation. (laughs) <laughs> it says the question whether or no he made this remark is in too much doubt to give full credit to it. It is not pretended that the words were written, but only that they were spoken in the presence of a single witness who is said to have uttered, uh, who have attested to their utterance. It, the Jesuits can manufacture any defense they want because they're not bound by any law, either of man or of God, to preserve their order. And they obviously simply made up this speech by Pope Pius VI in order to justify their taking refuge in a quote-unquote heretical nation such as Russia 
and, and Prussia. Now, this would place him in the attitude of performing a public act contrary to his private judgment, which might well enough be done where temporal matters only are involved, but not by a pope concerning spiritual matters. Hence, it is scarcely to be supposed that Pope Pius VI ever uttered these words, but they amount to nothing which reaches the dignity of an official act if he did for the plain reason that the decree of abolition having been a solemn official act under the quote-unquote seal of the fishermen, if subject at all to revocation or modification by any of the successors of Pope Clement XIV, could only have been so dealt with by an official act of corresponding solemnity. For some causes judicial decrees may be changed or annulled, but only by other judicial decrees, and it will not be pretended, even by the Jesuits, that a decree pronounced by a pope under the authority of the, of the canon law and the unvarying custom of the church is of less dignity than the decrees of civil courts. What is said by de Montour disproves the allegation of Dornyak. He tells us that when the Jesuit general in Russia took steps as would have enlarged the society by the admission of neophytes, Pope Pius VI commanded him to, uh, commanded him to cease. Whilst in this he does not seem to have condemned the existence of the Jesuits in Russia, it emphatically approves the decree of abolition by executing it elsewhere. Not to condemn their existence in Russia was a simple act of omission, differing essentially from a direct approval. But whether what he did was the one or the other, it undoubtedly had the effect of enabling the Jesuits in Russia to defy the decree of Pope Clement XIV by keeping their organization alive there, so that at the death of General Ritchie, they elected a successor of their own, who conducted himself and the society in open opposition to the Roman Catholic Church, the Pope, and the canon law. All, therefore, that can be justly said about Pope Pius VI is that he occupied an equivocal attitude, not willing to approve directly by any official act the existence of the society of, of the Jesuits in Russia, yet leaving the decree of suppression by Pope Pius the, uh, Pope, uh, Pope Clement XIV in full force. But what's, whatsoever Pope Pius VI may have done or said, his immediate successor, Pope Pius VII, did, quote, authorize the society to establish itself in white Russia, unquote. This he did, in 1801, 28 years after the decree of Pope Clement XIV. It was not done, however, by a mere verbal declaration to that effect, but by a formal bull, or brief, or decree, no matter by what name you may call it, in observance of the usual formality. From this it is to be implied that there had been no attempt to change or limit the decree of suppression by Pope Pius VI, for if there had been, this repetition would have been unnecessary. Pope Pius VII manifestly understood that without the official solemnity of a new bull, brief, or decree, no effect would have followed. That is, that his mere verbal assent, if he had given it, would have amounted to nothing. But when he did, but what he did was equivocal, to say the least of it by both affirming and disaffirming the decree of Pope Clement XIV. Remember, Clement XIV said they're abolished forever, everywhere. Pope Pius VII officially, publicly, and authoritatively gives permission of the Jesuits to operate in Russia. This is a direct contradiction to his predecessor. Now, it says it affirmed... 
it affirmed it in so far as the decree was left in force in the Roman Catholic states of Europe, where the jurisdiction of the Pope as the head of the church was recognized, and disaffirmed it in Russia, where the Pope had no jurisdiction. It was as much as to say that the Jesuits should not exist as an organized society among Roman Catholics, but might do so among schismatics and heretics. You see, the Vatican knows what the Jesuit order is all about. They have a copy of the Constitution of the Jesuits. The Constitution of the Jesuits swears that they will do everything in their power to destroy Protestantism and all schismatics and heretics of whatever name, even Russian Orthodox. No matter what, even in this case where the Jesuits are openly opposed by the papacy, the papacy realizes that their, great, that, that their greatest strength against their opposition is the Jesuits. They depend upon the Jesuits to destroy Protestantism and, and, the, and the Eastern Orthodox sect of the, of the Catholic Church. Both regarded by the papacy as heretical, condemned and excommunicated, and under the ban of, 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 of excommunication. Now it says, no matter what idea he intended to convey with regard to their abolition among the former, that is the Roman Catholic Europe, he accepted it as an accomplished fact which he was officially bound to recognize. To have done otherwise would have been perilous to the church by inciting the opposition of the Roman Catholic sovereigns who could not be reconciled to the Jesuits and would have offended the multitude of European Christians who had approved their abolition. He couldn't come right outright and, and defy Pope Clement XIV's decree of, of suppression and abolition of the Jesuits and allow the Jesuits to begin operations again in Europe. There was too much odium against the Jesuits in Europe. The only hope for the, the continuation of the Jesuit order was to find refuge outside of Roman Catholic nations. <laughs> That's it. Look, it, this, this is very, very telling if we comprehend exactly what's happening. The papacy was forced to deal this way with the Jesuits because of universal disdain for the Jesuit order by Roman Catholic sovereigns. The Pope ruled over the kings of the earth, and the kings of the earth wanted the Jesuits gone. The Roman Catholic kings of Europe, under the Pope's divine right to rule, wanted the Jesuits gone. Pope Clement XIII defended the Jesuits until he was finally forced to suppress them and was killed the night before that formal announcement. Pope Clement XIV, his successor, knew that when he suppressed the Jesuits, when he finally accomplished the suppression of the Jesuits, when he signed the order, he was signing his own death threat, his own death warrant. But even then, the papacy knows that it cannot survive, it cannot continue in its quest to obtain for itself a global supremacy without the help of the Jesuits. And they simply allowed the Jesuits to flee to heretical nations to find refuge among heretics and Protestants and liberals in Prussia and Russia so that they might be used again at the soonest opportunity. And that opportunity came quickly. We'll talk about that tomorrow on the program. You've been listening to Inquisition Update on FirstAmendmentRadio.com. 
100 days, 100 subscribers at $7 will bring FirstAmendmentRadio.com to the minimum level necessary to sustain it through 2015. Go to support.firstamendmentradio.com. $7 a month. Really, you can afford that for our Protestant First Amendment rights and the gospel of the kingdom message. Where your heart is, there will your treasure be also. Go to support.firstamendmentradio.com. I know you all want answers, and believe me, so do I, and I'll do my best to get them. Have you seen the Left Behind movies? Have you read the Left Behind fictional book series? Not everyone believes Left Behind is true prophecy. Some may even regard as conspiratorial the mainstream re-release of the Left Behind movie with actor Nicolas Cage portraying the main character as an attempt to further reinforce in the minds of all this perception of false prophecy in order to condition the masses for the play about to begin. Because they see the world stage shaping to fulfill what they have been led to believe is sound biblical interpretation, a left behind rapture scenario. This false view of prophecy is reinforced in the mind, not only of its adherents, but also includes those who have been merely exposed to the specific media. Is it possible that false prophecy can be fulfilled? The rapture theories have always been in dispute. Pre-trib, mid-trib, and post-trib disputes have risen up in exclusively evangelical circles of recent history so that when true believers don't suddenly disappear, this element will easily go by the wayside when all see a new Jewish temple begin to be built. Will this be part of the great delusion that will come upon the whole earth? It seems that this great prophetic delusion has already overcome practically the entire American evangelical and Christian world. Get the book. The rapture will be canceled. To learn more, visit crosstheborder.org. That's C-R-O-S-S, crosstheborder.org. Record budget deficits, bankruptcies galore, and the U.S. dollar is at an all-time low. With today's gloomy economic outlook, safe investments are often hard to find. For over a decade, Melody Cedarstrom at Discount Gold and Silver Trading Company has been helping people secure their future by investing in the precious metals. Melody has the honesty, integrity, and experience that is often lacking in the precious metals business. Let her put it to work for you. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 800-375-4188. That's 800-375-4188. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. That's CrossTheBorder.org. I know you all want answers, and believe me, so do I, and I'll do my best to get them. Despite Nicolas Cage's promise to do his best to get left behind rapture answers for us, don't hold your breath. Not everyone believes left behind is true prophecy. Some may even regard as conspiratorial the mainstream re-release of the Left Behind movie with actor Nicolas Cage portraying the main character as an attempt to further reinforce in the minds of all this perception of false prophecy in order to condition the masses for the play about to begin. If you want true Bible prophecy answers, get the book, The Rapture Will Be Cancelled. The author exposes the Latin rapture origin, the seven-year tribulation deception, true Bible revelation of Daniel's 70 weeks, the abomination of desolation, the restrainer, America in the revelation, the image of the beast, and the mark of the beast, and the truth about God's chosen people, and so much more about Bible prophecy. This book will shatter the left-behind paradigm of future events. Get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, 
To get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. That's crossthborder.org.